Uh, so, hi everyone. We're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, is this on? Yeah. Great. Uh, so I'm Rosanna Flutie. I will be moderating this afternoon's session uh, on open participatory. Um, the first two presenters we're gonna have are from the United States Memorial Hol uh, Museum, Holocaust Museum. Um, Alyssa Frankel and Michael Halley Goldman um, will be talking about taking citizen history seriously. Uh, we will have them present from 2 to 2.30 uh, and then pass it over to Sharon Leon, Director of Public Program, uh, Director of Public Projects at Roy Rosenzweig Center for History and New Media. We'll take questions after the first session uh, and then we'll uh, pass it to Sharon. Great. Thank you. Good. Right. Uh, so, oh, it does work. Excellent. Uh, hi, everybody. Good afternoon. I'm the one that's Michael. This one is, is Alyssa. So just to, if you want clarification. And I hope you don't mind if I come out here with you. We're not that big of a group. So uh, thanks for coming. So I want to remind you that you have voluntarily come in the kind of 2 o'clock after lunch sleepy period of time to something with the word serious in the title. Awesome job. Good. You guys, it's a brave move. So uh, while we're getting the slides up, uh, this is really about us thinking through implications of this concept of citizen history that we've been talking about for a long time. And uh, one of the things we're, one of the things I'm, I'm making a lot of assumptions about all of you, so I'd love to hear, actually, a show of hands, we're almost small enough, we could, we could have you all talk about it, but let's not do that right now. Um, how many of you are currently running something that you might call a crowd, citizen, participatory, not a community, not digital, not, uh, wait, skip those terms. How many, how many of you are running a project like that right now? O only one. Wow, okay, that's awesome. How many of you are thinking about running a project like that right now? A few of you. Okay, that, that helps. So uh, this is um, a little bit theoretical and a little bit of, of practical. That's why Alyssa and I are doing it together. Um, and um, the, the, the concept of seriously, there we go, thank you. We could do that jointly. The concept of serious, right, is, is something that I realize is heavy. And I do remind you, we are from the Holocaust Museum, so that's kind of normal for us. We're going to try to keep this fairly quick and light, though, as we can. Um, it really comes from this question of what do we mean by citizen history versus crowdsourcing, right? This is, this is a distinction that we made, and people have been talking a lot about language since we've been here this week, right? These, these terms, community, whichever ones you want to use. And we do want to say that we love crowds, right? There's nothing wrong with crowdsourcing. We're not suggesting that there's anything that's better than the other, right? That, that crowds, uh, crowdsourcing, a lot of great museum work has been done uh, from the Steve Project through the Smithsonian's um, transcription project, right? This has all been going on this really well. But we do think there's actually an important distinction. And we think if we take those implications seriously, I'm going to blow the ending. So Alyssa is going to have to deal with this part. The blo that if we take some of these implications seriously, we as a museum field have a lot we could be doing. We have a lot of incredible expertise uh, in terms of uh, experience with experience. We have a lot of great expertise with education and learning that hasn't really been applied to this larger area in the way that I think it could be. And it's really a call out for all of you and all of us, really, to start doing more of that. So we have been doing crowdsourcing for years, not the two of us, but other people in our institution have been doing crowdsourcing for years. There's an Ancestry.com partnership that we've been in. Uh, they have uh, indexed over 800,000 names from Holocaust documentation. It's a great project. But when Alyssa and I and our missing co-conspirator David Clevin uh, did a project about seven years ago, uh, we did not call it a crowdsourcing project. We called it citizen history. And it was a very intentional move. We were not saying uh, citizen history as a, just another way to say crowdsourcing. We were doing this with some very specific things in mind. One of them is that we were comparing to citizen science. So how many of you are really comfortable with the concept of citizen science? Kate, do not raise your hand. Okay, so you guys are pretty, pretty comfortable with it. One of the things that um, is important about citizen science, as you probably then know, is that it's about research, right? These are scientists who have a long history of doing research with the public or the community or the people out there or however you want to call them, right? And that is something we were trying to emulate with citizen history. We were trying to think about what does it mean to do history with those people that are out there, but we want them to be kind of part of us in here. What's that going to be like? There were other ideas behind citizen that I think are equally important. We could probably go one more forward. Citizen uh, is important to us as an institution, right? Okay, so we're going to keep asking you to raise your hands just because it's fun. Uh, 
How many of you have been to the Holocaust Museum? Just to get a sense of, all right, so one of the things that you might or might not have picked up in it is that this question of who are you as a citizen in a democracy and what does it mean to be active is something that is an underlying theme within that institution. So it being a citizen history is rather important to us in terms of our mission, in terms of central to who, being central to who we are. Um, also important is this concept of citizen, which is that a citizen has responsibilities and rights within a democracy. Right? Just, be, just because you are a citizen, not only is a lot expected of you, but you also have the ability to participate in various types of, of, of ways, voting being the most obvious one coming up soon, or just came up soon, either way. So what I want to suggest is a fairly simple directional difference between crowdsourcing and citizen history, right? And it's about what your original goals are. A lot of the crowdsourcing projects that we've seen are coming from collections and access goals, right? There's nothing wrong with this. This is actually a great practice. Uh, the first goal is we've got this collection and we're trying to figure out how to understand it better, how to describe it better, how to make it more accessible. Those are good questions. And we start using a lot of techniques that are very similar to the techniques we're using for citizen history. The difference is directional. We are coming at citizen history because we're about research and educational goals. Really the first question is what kind of environment are we trying to create with people out there that we are, would want them to be in in the first place, right? This is, this is the kind of environment we want. It's where they're going to be learning, where they're going to be thinking about history because they are doing history and they're doing it with us. We are not doing it for them. This doesn't mean that we don't have a role in terms of shaping it. That's a whole other discussion we can get into another time. But that's the distinction for us that's actually pretty important. Uh, the project that Alyssa is going to talk about in about a minute and a half um, is uh, one that is based not on any collections that we have within our institution, right? Which doesn't always make our collection staff happy, but the important part of it is there's some research questions that we are think is are, are important that raise questions that we are thinking uh, it will help us and the people we're participating with think about America and what it means to be American during the Holocaust and looking at that differently. That's where we started the project. And if we think about the project that way from this direction, history unfolded, uh, then there are a lot of implications if we take that direction seriously. And I will hand it over to Alyssa. Thank you. So I have notes. I'm going to stand over here and speak behind the podium. Um, so the one thing that I really want to stress before I jump into talking about the project and about the general note of taking this seriously is that this is real. We're not asking people to do busy work. We're not asking people to go and do something just for the sake of doing it. We're asking people to go and answer a question that we actually need their help to answer. Um, so when it comes to history <laughs> unfolded, yay. Um, you all are getting a sneak peek at our alpha. We just launched this on Monday. Um, we are in testing the beta launches in 10 days. Um, so stay tuned. We'll have a URL for you eventually. Um, it's, it's coming. Um, so when we were looking at history unfolded, um, we really wanted this to be a real exploration into what US newspapers reported on Holocaust era events. So what, really answering the question of what Americans knew when. And a lot of work's been done on things like the New York Times, the Chicago Tribune, the big papers. But not a lot of work has been done on the local papers, on things that ordinary Americans knew in real time or in close to real time. Um, so this is our first real, honest to goodness, citizen history project, where we're saying go out, learn how to read a newspaper. First of all, learn how to look at a newspaper, figure out what all the headlines mean and how to, how to use one, because we found that it's foreign to most of our high school users. Um, and then go out and give us the information. Tell us what you find there. And then help us to shape the exhibition that we've got opening in 2018 that will, we hope, involve some of the work that's been done by our citizen historians. So we're back to seriously. What does it mean to take citizen history seriously? And we posit that there are four fronts in which we need to be taking citizen history seriously. First of all, we need to take our participants seriously because first and foremost, they take us seriously. There's a contract embedded in citizen history that says everyone in the partnership gives something to everyone else, where the institution says, we have an honest question, we need your help. And from this partnership, we are going to receive data and we're going to receive information that helps us to answer these questions. And the participant says, well, I have data to give and I have time to give you, but from this, I'm going to expect a positive experience and a learning experience, something that I can take with me to my life from having worked with you. Um, and the public really wants to be a part of what we do. I mean, we started these pilots last year to kind of learn what it is that the public wanted out of a crowdsourcing project, what they were willing to do. And so we sent this email saying, hey, we have a pilot, would you like to test it? And we got these responses. Um, these are the top four reasons for not participating in our transcription project. 
Um, <laughs> these are really good reasons for not participating in a transcription project. Um, but people said, you know, I'm so sorry. I, I really wish I could help you, but I just had a baby. And people really take this stuff seriously. Like they, they take the ability to help a museum in its work very seriously. And the fact that we're willing to say, we might be historians, but historians don't have all the answers and history is not complete, that we still have things where we need your help to truly answer them. Um, we have this theme of guilt. There's a lot of guilt embedded in this. Um, and we try to make sure that that stays kind of in, in that realm and we don't put the guilt onto the participants, they bring it to us. Um, so in creating History Unfolded, one of the things that we did was create a participant dashboard so that people could see how much work they'd done and really give some validation to the fact that people were putting in a lot of time on this project, we hope. Um, so they can see what they've done, they can see articles that they've submitted, they can see articles that they've saved as they're doing their own research on the site. Um, so a lot of work has been done based on work that we did earlier to try and really make this about the participant and make it a very good experience for them. Next, we need to take our staff seriously because this stuff takes a lot of time. Um, I community manage the Children of the Woods Ghetto Citizen History Project, our first foray into citizen history for uh, about four years until we finally uh, sunsetted it this spring. Um, it was very sad. And it took a lot of time. Um, there were nights when I would be up till three. There were nights that I'd you know, be up with students who were on the project. And I'd just be up responding to research and asking the community questions and responding to their questions. And it would just be all of this time. And not only that, there's time that's embedded in the community manager doing the work. There's time that's embedded in building the, the thing. Time that you have to dig into it in order to create a really positive experience. So we need people who are full time and we need people who are willing to give their time, an institution that's willing to support the fact that we need people full time or most of their time on these projects. And if all that finally works out, then we can have happiness. Um, so we determined a number of things that um, you need a community manager who can do five different roles all at once. They need to be your cheerleader, they need to be your listener, they need to be your teacher and your diplomat, um, and that person who sits there and is very willing to click yes, click no on, on all of those submissions that come in. So somebody with a ton of patience. And then you need a dedicated team on the project creating it. So we determined that you need a dedicated project lead, that was me for History Unfolded, um, and then an educator, an historian, and this community manager. Um, so people who actually have time to give to this. So this is not a side project. This is something that actually needs time and needs support. Um, and then you need to take the institution's role seriously. Um, the idea that the institution has a role to play in all this, that it's not just the individuals, again, doing this as a side project, but it's the institution saying, yes, we need your help. No, we cannot do this without you. We talk about this as like this two-way conversation, and particularly with the advent of social media, we often talk about finally having two-way conversations with our visitors. But it's not really a two-way conversation. A lot of times what we call two-way conversation is actually two one-way conversations going past each other. The museum puts out its marketing information, they're how cool are we in our, our this day in history, and people say back, here's what I saw at your museum, and we're just kind of going past each other like ships in the night. So citizen history really goes to the heart of valuing two-way communication in a very honest way. That you're willing to listen to each other and willing to respond honestly and openly. And that's big for an institution, particularly an institution like ours, where we're dealing with very sensitive material and Holocaust-era data. But I'm here to tell you that if we can do it, if the institution that I work at can have the trust in its users and can put the trust in a community manager to be able to be the voice of the museum and to be able to respond to these people, then your institutions can do it too. <laughs> Trust me. Um, and this is how it becomes a true contract, like I was talking about before, that the institution says, yes, we do need you. It's not just some person saying, yeah, I think we need your help, but the institution puts its full force behind this and says, we're willing to put budget behind this and staff behind this for you to have a good experience and for you to be able to learn and then give us the data that we need to do something real with. And then finally, before we close and uh, open up to your question, we. Um, we just want to talk about taking the, the role of the field seriously in this. Um, that it's more than just individual museums doing this work. That it really goes to the heart of what we see ourselves being as museums. AAM has been making a pretty big deal recently about museums being places of learning. And if that's something that, again, we take seriously, then that's something that we have to be able to put our force behind and say that we're going to go beyond just indexing our collections and inviting people to go in our collection materials for our benefit 
that we're going to let them into our collections, to other collections, we're just going to open it all up and be very open about our data and open about our access and allow people to help us to answer our questions as an entire field. And if this is something that we can all work on together, starting here and starting now, then maybe by the time we hit MCN next year, we'll have a lot more crowd projects going on and really thinking about the ways in which our visitors are shaped by the work that we're doing. Um, yeah. Oh, one more thing. So this is, um, sorry, I forgot I had the slide in here. Um, so this is, again, a page from History Unfolded where it goes to the heart of the learning that we're doing, um, that we want our users to be doing. Not only did we put out these 10 Holocaust era events that we wanted our users to research around, but we also created modules for all of them where we have information about why you would want to research, for instance, Charles Lindbergh's Un American Speech in Des Moines. You know, why should you care? What are the keywords? Why is this important? What is the context in which this sits? So we're not just saying go out and find this. We're scaffolding the experience. We have someone, and the community manager who we're going to be working with is someone who comes from an educational background. And they, they understand the whole idea of scaffolding and teaching and creating together. So if we can give people who wouldn't necessarily be working with us this idea about what the context is for what they're researching, then we've already created a better and stronger experience because they don't just know what they're doing or how to do it, but they know why they're doing it too. Um, I wondered if we could take some questions on this project. Yes. Wow, we did that fast, didn't we? Uh, That's good. Um, mm. I'd love to ask the first question and just ask about the mechanisms for um, pulling people into these projects and how that works. Sure. You want to start? Yes. Go for it. Um, so. There are a lot of different ways you can pull people into these projects. Um, we're fortunate that for History Unfolded, we have the full force of the marketing department behind us. So after we reach out to our low-hanging fruit, to our usual suspects, our Holocaust history teachers, um, and then to project partners that we're already working with, we're going to be working with brand new people. Um, we have incredibly high goals for History Unfolded. We want to reach 20% of high school history students. Um, so if any of you know ways to reach high school history students, please let us know. We're, we're very curious. Um, but we're going to be reaching out to teachers of American history, teachers of journalism and citizenship and, um, and civics, um, and just finding new ways, new audiences that we haven't reached before. Mm. Historically, when I was managing the Children of the Woods Ghetto Project, a lot of what we were doing was reaching out to our teacher fellows and to our project partners there. Um, and just you know, going back to the people who already knew us and already related to us, knowing that they already had a connection, and then we could work with them to find new ways to augment that connection. Mm -hmm. And then follow-up question, could you speak to the longitudinal commitment of time um, that, that folks, as they engage in these projects? Do you mean in terms of, of how long do you have to be a part of it? Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's, it ranges. I mean, so one of the things, I think, in terms of the commitment as the institution, one of the things that we imagine this as, and we're trying to really get institutional buy-in, is for the idea that this is one of many types of project, types of research projects that are going on. Um, we'd like to see them span a, a wide range of being able to do something very fast and, and very, very, um, without a lot of, uh, of additional expectations to people who are really digging in and going for a long period of time. This one is, is uh, it depends on how much you want to commit, uh, whether you really want to seek out newspapers on microfilm, whether you want to do a lot of these things that are really hard. There are uh, sources that are a lot easier to access online, there are just not as many of them as one might imagine. Um, but people could do some of that fairly quickly, get one, one hit in a particular area and be gone. Mm -hmm. So it, it, I think some range on that. Mm -hmm. Here, I, here, I will. Uh, can you just briefly describe what, what do people do um, when they're doing the research and what do they submit to you and what do you do with that? Yes, I, I can describe that. Um, so we are asking for a very big task here. We're asking people to go to their local libraries and research in microfilm. Oh. <laughs> um, yes. And so we're, we're asking people to go into their local libraries and research in microfilm 10 events that we've pre-selected from Holocaust era history in the United States and Europe. And we're asking them to submit a number of things, including the newspaper where, the, where they found the article, um, the city and state where that was published, the headline, the subhead, the author, the page that, that it was on, the type of article it is, and then any comments they have about the import of the article they found or anything else they think is germane. Um, so it's basically metadata. And then we're asking them to submit a photo of the article 
not necessarily for publication in any way, because we're, we're running into some copyright stuff there, but so that our community manager can go through and check and make sure that this is a legit article from a, an actual paper as opposed to somebody making something up. between crowdsourcing and citizen history is meaning useful for researchers but meaningful for the citizens. And yeah. that you, by, you split it into two, so it's the metadata is what's really you know, reliable and you know that's gonna be useful for you, but then it's their added interpretation that makes them, that's, that's meaningful to them and satisfying to them and you can do with that what you want. Right, right? so I've, I've spent a lot of time thinking about this. I was actually just pondering this this morning because I've been chewing on it for a while. Um, and. I'm, I am concerned that this is going to be seen as just a crowdsourcing project, not as one that actually takes on citizen history. But again, part of what makes citizen history citizen history is in that contract of saying that there is give and take in this relationship, that it's not just the museum asking for help, that it's the museum being willing to give back as well. And so what we're offering is the chance to practice the historian's craft. And it could be anything from learning how to use a microfilm machine to going in and doing your own interpretation and telling us why this is important. And a lot of that's going to rest with the community manager to try and pull those stories out and help people to go along that educational journey to figuring out why this article is important. But the other thing that makes this citizen history not crowdsourcing is again, looking at the goals that we have for this project where we're not asking them to index our data. We're asking them to go out to the world and find the data and pull it together and then put it in one place so that other historians can make use of it. And, and also, I think one of the things to add with that is that it's also information from their own communities, right? The, the, what we're trying to encourage people to do is to look in the newspapers that are close to them, right? So that there is a tie between what's going on in their community during this time period and not just random stuff that's out there, which I think is a, a, an aspect as well. Yeah. Um, so I, I think the comparison with citizen science is pretty brilliant, but uh, when I think of citizen science, they're, they're two aspects that I don't really see present here. First, most citizen science projects don't belong to any one institution. They're usually like these sort of, um, like, like bird banding and bat banding and stuff. Like these are huge things that everybody is working on. And um, for instance, like in, in my town, there's this bio blitz event where like five or six different museums all send their staff out to supervise children in catching bugs and stuff. Um, and, but also when there isn't like a blitz event, there's usually a whole bunch of like little clubs and stuff that are always participating in those sort of citizen science events. Well, uh, two so. comments. I mean, I think it's not a perfect comparison, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, two, but it could you, be. You do see, you do see no. um, individual institutions doing citizen science things as well. And the other thing I would add is that citizen science is incredibly well developed. If you talk to our friends over at the Smithsonian, it's been happening since the 1800s. So give us some time on clubs. I think, you know. Yeah, it, yeah. It, I, I just mean, how can you decentralize this? Right. Well, I mean, so this is actually, in some sense, this call to the museum field is like, how do we do more things where we are thinking about this as what the museum has to contribute uh, from the museum's perspective to these kinds of projects? Uh, Sharon strange. and I were both happened to be at the crowd consortium thing, uh, the IMLS sponsored great conversation in the spring uh, about uh, uh, basically participatory projects for cultural institutions, um, but there were really almost no museums there at all. And I think museums have a, a huge amount to contribute to this. At least this is our angle on, on no one way we could do it. And no history. And no history. Yeah. Um, the other thing that I want to bring in there is in hiring our community manager, one of the things that struck me most about what, what the individual said was that um, they wanted to use a train the trainer model to bring this forward so that we'd be working not just with the, the museum being centralized, but really training people in the communities to take this out more broadly. So it really is intended to be a community-based project in the way that this person envisions it. I think we should invite um, Sharon to set up, but we've one, while she's setting up, we'll do one more question. Thanks. Uh, how do you ensure uh, with this project uh, intercode or reliability so that you have, uh, if you have two different people looking at the same newspaper article, that you would get two similar um, interpretations and not have, I mean, do you have any st coding standards that you use, any recommendations as part of the orientation, or how do you do that? It, it's, it's not a perfect world. Actually, you might be able to answer this better than I can for this project. I, I know with some of our previous projects um, that, that part, part of the job of the community manager is to be looking for things that are outliers and things that are different and trying to help steer people towards presenting good data, also relying on, on the training of when it's in classrooms that the teachers are also aware of these things. But we, we, I don't think we have any kind of perfect solution for this yet. We don't. And 
we so the, the only mechanism that we have for preventing duplicate data, or preventing bad data, is really the community manager going through and spending those long nights and long mornings going through all of the data and seeing what's there. Um, but they also have recourse to be able to, you know, talk to a teacher, talk to a student, and say, hey, you know, you keep inputting the dates backwards, like you're putting the month where the day goes, mm -hmm. which I ran into all the time with the Woods Project, all the time. And so they can say, oh, sorry, we, we've been putting the dates in wrong, we'll go fix the dates. Um, so it's, ag again, a learning opportunity that anytime something is wrong, it's not really wrong. It's just some, an opportunity for them to be able to go back and say, here's a chance for you to look more closely at what, what this is doing. Let's go back and do this again. Super. All right. We'd love to hear more from everyone. Uh, again, this is something we are excited about doing, but we really would love the input from the community. It would be great. Thank you for uh, listening today. Thanks so much. So I just leaned over Alyssa's shoulder and said that we should have gone in the opposite order because this project that they're talking about is, in fact, exemplifies all of the things that I'm going to try and urge the larger community to think about and, and enact. Um, of the folks in the room, how many of you consider yourselves historians by training? All right, that's more than I would expect, I actually. Yeah. Hmm? I asked the wrong question. Yeah. Hmm? Public historians? Fewer? And people are primarily concerned with digital things, or all three. OK, all right. Um, so I feel like I'm screaming into this mic. Um, <laughs> I am in the midst of sort of working on a project that is about um, trying to think about how to create user-centered digital public history. And so this conversation is going to be at sort of a little bit of a more abstract level. Than, than the first presentation. Um, and the things that I want to think about today are about how we can take seriously, again, the commitments of historians and public historians to uh, their methodological practice and how we can think about how to build digital things for the public that actually bring that stuff into the world. And so when I'm talking about or thinking about the commitments of historians, those of you who are historians in the room, these are going to look really familiar. That if you think about what historians recognize about each other when they encounter new material is that the first question is always, what does the evidence say? What the documents, they're not all documents, all right? But we like to talk about them as documents. What does, what does the evidence say? Um, we're concerned about change over time. We're concerned about multiple perspectives. We think there's probably never one cause, right? Multiple causation is probably a pretty good part of most things. And that, that interpretation and perspective is part and parcel of everything from what, what happens historically to how we deal with it, how we present it, and um, how we talk about it as a community. And that actually, I think, maps really nicely onto what have become some of the shared commitments of public historians in the world. Um, those of you who might be oral historians in the world will recognize the shared authority uh, trope comes originally from Michael Frisch in the, in, in the world of oral history. You can't do an oral history without authority always already being shared. Well, I would like to think that as public historians, we shouldn't be doing anything where authority isn't always already shared. And in order to do that, we have to engage in dialogue, be committed to reflexive practice, reflective and reflexive practice, if we're lucky, we get to the space of co-creation, which is exactly what you guys are doing. Um, and that in all of this, it might be useful for us to think about historical thinking and how it works and how we can move the conversation uh, forward by being really specific and intentional about historical thinking. And so lots of my thinking on this has been actually shaped by some really good work in cognitive science about how people learn. And it's not really, it's not very new work. I mean, this is from the National Academies Press um, from 2000, but it brings together an awful lot of really good research on actually how people learn. And it's directed particularly at, at students and teachers, but it absolutely works for us in informal learning situations. Um, and the findings of all of these studies that have been aggregated in the How People Learn corpus of materials come up with sort of three really important principles that I think, if we kept them in mind, we'd build different public history projects. Now, as I said, they're, they're, they're framed in terms of students, but we're thinking about, about all learners here. Um, and the first one is that students come to classrooms 
or visitors come to museums or to websites with preconceptions about how the world works. And their initial understand, if their initial understanding is not engaged, they may fail to grasp the new concepts and information that they are taught, or they may learn them for the purpose of a test or just while they're there, but revert to their preconceptions outside the classroom. This seems fairly uh, elementary. If we don't meet people where they are, we're never going to move forward in their understanding of historical concepts of the world, right? So the second one is to develop a competence in an area of inquiry, a student must A, have a deep foundation of factual knowledge. That's hard in informal learning, right? Um, an understanding of facts and ideas in the context, context of a conceptual framework. How intentional are we about making visible our conceptual frameworks? Um, and to organize that knowledge in a way that facilitates retrieval and application. Uh, this one of the three, I think, is the hardest for us to think about as folks who work in informal learning situations it, because we can't account for how deep that foundation of factual knowledge is. Um, we can assess it, but we don't have as many consistent chances to build on it. Um, and then the final one is this notion of metacognition. A metacognitive approach to instruction can help students learn to take control of their own learning by defining learning goals and monitoring their own progress in achieving them. This, as far as I'm concerned, is the holy grail of doing public history. If we can actually get people to think about the process, the cognitive process that they go through in encountering new things about the past, we empower them to do their own public history work, to do their own investigations. Um, so what I'd like to think about in the course of the next couple of minutes is um, what does this mean for us in thinking about building digital history work and digital museum work that takes some of these concepts and tries to instantiate them in the digital world? Um, and my first question is, uh, what does user research look like when we consider preconceptions about history? Do we even consider them? So lots of us who have been doing work recently in, in building large-scale systems and, and large-scale projects, we do a lot of user research and persona building. In the next session, I'm sure that Darren Milligan is going to talk about the personas and the process for putting together the Smithsonian Learning Lab. And the idea that you would do enough user research that you could have personas to design for is sort of one of these core concepts of building uh, for web applications. But is it a core concept for building for web applications in public history that we also need to know where those people fall on the spectrum, spectrum of knowledge about the content that we're dealing with? We know in this case what they're looking for is experience with curriculum development in conjunction with digital experience. But there's no breakdown here about disciplinary knowledge. And if we want to be serious about thinking about history and building for historical understanding or science and building for science understanding or any of those things, that do we go the next step to understand what the baseline is about that disciplinary understanding? And of course, SI Learning Lab is not the only folks who are doing this and publishing their personas and making them available in the world. Uh, these personas are from the Tapapa Museum. All of their stuff is, is just wonderfully available and free on the web. This is on GitHub from, from Tapapa. Um, and again, we see that this is, this is a persona that is oriented towards the institution, but not oriented towards the specific content or questions, the disciplinary um, investigations and inquiry that they may want to undertake uh, in a particular exhibit or in a particular, uh, in a particular website. And so, what I wonder is why we're not building for historical understanding as, as organizations that's do, that are doing history. We're, we've sort of picked up all of this good stuff from doing good web development, and we haven't fully connected it to what we know about being good historians. And so what I'm hoping is that we can start to bring those things together. The problem is it's expensive, it's labor intensive, and it takes a ton of work. And what it seems like to me is that we had a moment. We had a moment in the development of web work in history where we were really invested in doing this kind of work. And this is a site from 2004 
from the Patum, Pamumtuk, I can't say it. Can somebody say it? Patumtuk. Patumtuk <laughs> Valley Memorial Association and Museum. Um, someday, I use this as an example all the time, and I can never say it. Um, but the Radon Deerfield site was built specifically to engage the notion of multiple perspectives, to ask a question about what happened and why it mattered from the five perspectives that were involved in the conflict, and not really to come to any sort of narrative decision, any, any clear answer, but to embrace the notion that there are going to be different causes and different perspectives. And it's a fabulous site. It looks a whole lot less fabulous now because it's <laughs> 11 years old and it's built in flash. And all, but the amount of intellectual work and, and the adventurousness of trying to embody historical thinking in the web is here. And there are several, there are several others. I mean, on, a, on a, a less complex level, I mean, I think even you know, a more perfect union from um, American history at the Smithsonian is not narrative driven. It's thematically driven. It's, um, and it asks all of those questions about multiple interpretations and multiple interactions and points of view in a way that is not, is not unilinear and driven um, by a simple story. But it, weirdly, it feels to a lot of, to me at least recently, a lot of that space for that complex building has closed. And that we've built a lot of collection sites, and we've built a lot of web add-ons to physical exhibits that really are collection sites with a little bit of annotation. Um, one of the projects that we have just sort of wrapped up at the Center for History and New Media is a mobile first site on the history of the National Mall. Um, and to do that site, it's an NEH funded site. Uh, and to put this site together, it was important for us not to be the Smithsonian or not to be the Library of Congress or not to be NARA because we could bring the resources from all those places together and try and do something interesting uh, with it. And the site and the structure of the site itself embodies what we think is important about the history. Um, it's a mobile first site because we think that in order to, to experience and learn about the history of the mall, it's important for you to be there. And so that you can walk around and see what was in various spaces in years past. So you walk down to the, to the corner of Constitution where uh, the National Gallery is and you look up and you see in the 1830s, you're looking at the Capitol in the 1830s in the period between 1830 and 1859, there's a slave depot there. And they're selling slaves on the, at the steps of the Capitol, right? And that changes your relationship to, to what it feels like to be in the space and to understand the history of the space. And so the maps are really important, but I think the thing that is most important about the site is that the more involved investigations of the history are about inquiry. They're framed as questions. And they're questions that we workshop deeply with test users about whether they were questions that were interesting, questions that they would explore, questions that they knew the answers to or didn't. Um, and those questions are then answered by five primary sources. And so we're watching this, this situation where, where we're trying to help people learn to ask questions about the past while also engaging already their pre-existing understanding of what the space is for. So this question about protest on the mall suggests that we all know that there are protests on the mall all the time, but they might not always have been that way and what, what should we know about that? Um, and that the evidence matters, that the primary sources matter. No matter where you are on the site, you're always two clicks away from a rich uh, collection of primary sources about the space. Uh, and so in trying to, trying to put the site together, what we're trying to do is think about our own theory about how history works and try and build it in, into, actually into the space on the web. Um, some of you might be familiar with uh, American History's new American Enterprise exhibit, which is a fabulous exhibit. It's a really interesting exhibit. And it's, do we have anybody here from NMAH? Don't tell me. Um, what I'm gonna say is that it's a really not interesting website. It's a really, it's a really add-on kind of website in this way that it's doing kind of 
Um, what I'm suggesting lots of our current web creations in the museum and public history space are doing is it's taking a little introductory narrative and then mm. it's giving us basically a collection site of the materials that are on exhibit in the hall. It's not asking and it, it's not asking or helping to answer any real meaningful questions that are answered in the exhibit itself, that are really engaged in the physical exhibit. Um, but the number of folks who are gonna get there is still gonna be small. Um, and, and I think we're just not capitalizing on the possibility that we could really be um, scaffolding for this sort of stuff. And so I say like, how can we, how can we move forward if our goal is really higher order and higher level engagement and development, not just descriptive stuff, um, but stuff with more complexity where we might, with our users, ask how and why things happened in the past. So I don't have a ton of answers because each one of these is an experiment. In our, in our case, they're often deep enough that it's a three or a four year experiment. This, you know, some of it's prototyping um, relatively quickly, but some of them are, are kind of major projects. But I do have some suggestions, and what I really want to know is whether or not they sound like they're decent suggestions to you and what you might add to them. And so I would say that in, these are my suggestions in scaffolding for understanding, that we need to do a much, much, much better job of working in collaborative teams so that the technologists, the technologists and the content experts come together to make sure that we're on the same page about what our own basic understanding of the history is, what kinds of methodological questions we're asking, and perhaps how we can start to meld those into the form and the media that we're trying to build. Um, and that we have to, before we do anything, actually find out what our visitor, what the baseline is of historical knowledge and question and get engagement of our visitors. We have to go back to doing that research, not just about digital expertise, but also about their engagement with the content. Um, and I think we can't do this if we keep doing giant scope work. It, the grain size is just too big. We have to ask smaller questions with specific sources that we can scaffold in a rich way so that people actually really do learn how to engage with them and do possibly learn how to um, pick up that method of engagement and apply it to new work. Um, and so, but the only way we can do that is if we build sites that explicitly communicate our conceptual frameworks. If we don't tell our users the reason we're putting this stuff together is because it lets us see that there are many causes and there are many perspectives and that everything is, has to be deeply contextualized for us to understand. They can't go to the next spot and say, hmm, I wonder what the other perspectives are, right? There has to be another cause here. There can't just be one. If we don't help them see that space, they can't move, they can't move it on. Um, and so, one way to do that is to create work that isn't a finished narrative. That, as Alyssa says, embraces the fact that there's so much stuff that we don't know, that we have lots of questions, and that our work is really about engaging those questions and, and the process of not knowing, and the process of trying to figure out from the ed evidence what happened. If, if we didn't wait till the end, we did, if we didn't wait till we knew what we thought to build the stuff, we'd have a much richer historical thinking experience with our publics. Um, and then I would say, as much as possible, if we can set up a situation where we can then let visitors loose on the things that they're interested in to try and create their own interpretation and their own work, uh, we can start to move this, this conversation forward. Um, so those are my guesses. But since I'm in the middle of this project, what I really want to know is, what do you all think we should be doing? Sure. Yeah. Sure. So I'm pretty frustrated by digital exhibits that are just sort of uh, made as part of an exhibition cycle and then they just die as these boutique abandoned projects that were really just a slideshow of images anyway. Yep. Uh, I am with you. So I, I'd really like all of my children to actually grow and, and do their own things. Yeah. So um, it may not be great for my administration, but I'd like to like 
build something and then even hand it off to a completely different institution if they're doing a similar exhibit so mm -hmm. that these things can be iterative or owned mm -hmm. collectively. Right. Um, and then we just apply new logos at the bottom of each right, we just keep about adding page. Up. Right. Sharing and adding up. Um, so I've had a lot of trouble with that lately. And yeah. I, I know that I can only continually sustain maybe two right. at a time. Right. Well, that's but true. That's, that's the much larger uh, question and problem <laughs> of digital sustainability for all of this work. And I get to say that from, a, from an organization that doesn't have any of its own collections to worry about. So for all of you who also have collections to deal with, uh, yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a hard problem. And things break, and uh, you know, and then, and right on Deerfield looks like it's from 2004, but it's still great. Oh, uh, because um, it's so multi purposefully multifaceted, um, and so it's a situation where we've got fi five cultures coming together and. And, and sharing their own, inter well, the historical evidence surfaces their interpretations of this conflict. And that for me, that um, undoes all of, all of the mess that timelines have created. Like digital history as timelines drives me nuts mm -hmm. because it's got this teleology embedded in it that there's a single story that runs from, from beginning to end. Um, and, and to put all of these perspectives in conversation with one another, you can start to see where, where, where cultures are talking past each other and why there's so much um, fraught conflict about some of the stuff that has happened in the world. And you know, this is centuries old and we're still trying to figure out what, um, what those different perspectives mean and what their lasting implications for those communities are. Uh, and so to be able to bring all of those lenses together around a single event, um, I think it just creates a lot of readerly empathy, participatory empathy from, from the user. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. I do have a comment. So we've talked at our institution, I know we've heard this at others, where the technologists need to be there at the beginning and when the, at Absolutely. the beginning of the discussion of the, of the exhibit and, uh, and so on. In this case, I almost wonder whether that uh, it, it may be harmful in some ways if they're there at the beginning. In other words, uh, well, I'm just to, you know that that they're they're throwing out the ideas of technology, but really you have to go through this first. Yeah. You really need to yes. discuss the concepts. Yeah. yeah. Before we shouldn't you be discuss building. With, we technology. shouldn't be building with the technology first. We should be building with the history. We have to have the the historical goals and questions first and then come and say, how can we make something that... And by the way, I can say that as a technology. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, me, I end up on both sides of the fence here, um, which leaves me talking to myself a lot. <laughs> but, but I do sort of think that we have to, we have to start with, with the content questions and, and that sort of thing. Did you want to add to that? I Allison? do want to add to yeah. that. So my personal belief about technology as somebody who straddles the line between historian, educator, and technologist, is that we need to have everybody there at the beginning of the process. Um, and that any time that we do a technology project, we should always be starting with our goals in mind and always be starting with the problem. So as long as we've got our big historical problem, if that's the problem we're trying to solve together, then that becomes our framework for everything that we're right. doing in the history and the technology. So if we get the technologists there, then they understand our reason for being there, that they're not building from the tech first. They're there learning with us, discovering what these questions and problems are, and then they're working to build from there. So it's getting everybody on board for this genesis of why we're here. Yeah. And then once we've got a common why, then we can all build forward together. That was a much better answer. <laughs> Can I ask a follow-up question to something you said, Sharon, about this closing that was happening, or you were using that. Could you say a little bit more? Because we are in a place, I think, where there's so much more openness to be working iteratively and, and right. bringing more stakeholders right. to the table. But some, some of it, I think that what I mean by, by closing, uh, closing is probably not the right term. I mean, we've turned, uh, we've turned away from these kinds of very focused, deeply articulated larger projects that it takes to, you know, to 
think about a, f a full process of inquiry in historical thinking um, in favor of other things that I'm really in favor of, mm -hmm. access, lots of material, making as much available as possible. And so I'm hoping that what we're starting, what, what might happen is that we've, we've been on this venture to make lots of collections material available and lots of metadata and lots of open data um, available to everyone that we may then turn soon to remobilize that stuff into these finer grained questions that I think that we, it, we're just about ready to take the next step to go back and it may be that the kinds of things that I'd like to see done will not be nearly as hard now and they may not be nearly as resource intensive and we may be able to do them much more quickly because our stuff isn't siloed and the data is shareable and the APIs all work and we can start to move these things into conversation with one another really, really closely in an easier way. Yeah. At least I hope. Other questions from the audience? Or stuff about next steps? <laughs> One last thing, since I promised you a URL. Um, oh, you have it. I have it. So uh, in 10 days, don't try to go there now because you will see nothing there. Um, check out newspapers.ushmm.org. Again, that's newspapers.ushmm.org. Call now. Call now. <laughs> Operators are standing by. Who did you have to pay to get that directory? <laughs> newspapers.ushmm. United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. Okay. Dot .org. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.